Grand Touring Motorsports started as a social group of car enthusiasts, but we've expanded into all sorts of motorsports disciplines, and we want to share our stories with you. Years of racing, wrenching, and motorsports experience brings together a top-notch collection of knowledge and information through our podcast, Break Fix. Let's set the scene. You, our loyal listener, are interested in learning to be a better driver and maybe even have aspirations of racing. However, you know virtually nothing about performance driving in motorsports. Well, tonight's guests are an amateur endurance auto racing team hoping to show everyone that they too can participate in performance driving and racing. They are a relatively new team and are sharing their experiences of do's and don'ts with you. That's right, Brad. And some of you might recognize our guests from their Super Friends inspired intro where the Vision and soon to be Wonder Woman host Garage Heroes in Training, a podcast which has recently eclipsed 300 episodes and covers all forms of racing. And as they say, hopes to be entertaining as well as educational. So without further ado, we are honored to welcome Bill and his beautiful bride, Vicki Fisher, host of Garage Heroes in Training, to Break Fix, crossover part one. I'm Take expecting f- to hear my husband, welcome to Garage Heroes. <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> right. Take 423. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a long night. The quickest yeah, way to get your episode count up. You just have 15 <laughs> intros and call yeah. it an episode. <laughs> well, so, sounds you know, like we know what we're doing. Good thing that's right. fake. Right. Good to be here. <laughs> so I'm looking at your podcast. I found it and I'm like sitting there going, this podcast is pretty good. So then I go and I, I'm looking through it and all of a I'm sudden take I start, that as a comp. I'm going to take that as a compliment. Back yeah, back. well, it should be. <laughs> and, you know, I'm looking at the podcast and all of a sudden I'm like, how is this podcast like 1027? I'm like, why didn't I find this thing before? And then I realized it's not one comma 027. It's one dot 027. I think it was season one, maybe. So I realized that A, I can't read and I'm an idiot. And B, I hadn't missed a thousand plus podcasts of yours. And I'm like, sitting going, how did I miss a thousand podcasts? Because I do a search every few weeks looking for automotive and racing related podcasts. And I'm like, A, how have we not met these guys at the track? And B, how did I miss a thousand episodes of a podcast? So anyway, you want to know the secret, but this is like a VIN number. The first number is the season number. The second digit specifies whether it's a main episode, Uh a drive through episode, a special episode, whatever. And then the last two digits are the actual episode number. So there you go. See, we were grossly uh, (laughs) guesstimating our skills. So we went with G hit for the normal episodes. We went with DWD for dominate with Dawson. And then we have the wood episodes, the way off our topic episodes. And then we purposely put in a four digit episode code. Like we're going to be here for at least, you know, a thousand episododes absolutely we never thought we would be but now we're like a third of the way so there, i'm gonna, so, I'm gonna you know, put you on we'll the finish. spot i'm gonna put yeah. you on the spot favorite episode so far of break fix so far the one that stick out for me are always the news ones because you guys don't just do the normal news there's always right. something in there that's like new news so exactly. that, that would be the one it's just generically, you guys always find something that I'm like, I didn't know that. And I listen to several podcasts because I listen at double speed or triple speed. So I, I go through them pretty quick. Crazy. I must sound like Alvin and the Chipmunks though, because I talk pretty fast. <laughs> it's, you're not the worst. There's a couple of podcasts that I actually can't do it. I can't X. listen to him when he, I can't be in the car when he does it. It's hard. I had to put headphones on. It just <laughs> short circuits my brain. I've got That's stuff awesome. to do. Well, we'll relay the message to Tanya because she is the executive co-producer, as we call her, of the drive through She takes a lot of pride in putting those episodes together, especially those Florida man stories. I mean, I don't know oh. where she gets them from. And I by the way, them. if you watch the behind the scenes, uh-huh. we never get to see the Florida man stories until the moment we record it because uh-huh. she wants that reaction. And it's really? absolutely awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So if you hear me laughing hysterically, it's not because I'm making it up. It's for real. (laughs) Just like every Break Fix episode, we want to learn about your origin story because, as we say, everyone has a story. So let's talk about the who, what, when, where, and how of how Garage Heroes in Training was formed. How how did it all get started? (laughs) It's his fault. (laughs) It's always my fault. It's his fault. He started it. I did. So the long story, which, you know, we have plenty of tape in the machine, so we should be good. The long story is exactly. We got invited through email to one of the BMW events 
and it was up at Monticello and it was basically turned into a, uh, a lead follow parade in a small autocross. And being the wise man that I am, I made sure that she beat me on every single autocross. Oh, don't know. No, I beat it you. Was legit. Plan. It legit. was planned. It was planned. So don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. That can spin <laughs> it here. So riding the crest of the wave, I'm like, hey, why don't we join this Monticello? It looked like a great place. And she's like, you're smoking serious crack. That's way too much money. So then coincidentally, I had started listening to the Everyone Racers podcast, and they also have a television show. And it just so happened that they had their Lemons adventure when they went to a race in Washington. And it was a disaster. But the great part of the story is it was a great episode on TV. And they said how it was a $500 car. And I said, hey, Vicky, this is a $500 car. And she bought it. So (laughs) the door was open. I didn't go with anything else and said, sure, this is great. And then we started trying to do this. And we eventually bought a a former race car from a, a now friend team that races in Lemons. We go to our first race and on the way home, I think we were both pretty much hooked. We used to play volleyball together. And then we go to this and we're driving home and separately because I was towing and she was driving with our daughter. You know, we were talking to each other. And it's like, wow, I think we found our, our tribe because, you know, my knees gave up on volleyball a, a while back. And when you get to a certain age, gravity gets higher wherever you stand. I don't know what happens. It's just weird. Bowling, that way. bowling was out. Tennis was tough. We decided he was falling to do apart. it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm a few spare parts away from a, a brand new chassis. We just found out that it was really great. And then we knew nothing about the sport. We knew nothing about driving. We have videos to prove we knew nothing about driving. We knew, we knew nothing about not, a, anything. We didn't nothing have a about wrench. Nothing. Right. nothing. So after our second race, we said, this is so much fun and so entertaining and everybody's so friendly, but it can be a little intimidating to get somebody to start because you mm-hmm. don't know the jargon. You don't know the tools. You, you don't know what you don't know. And the, the fear of the unknown makes it even more intimidating. Why don't we start documenting what we're doing and show people that literally anybody can do this? Because we went the uh, first race. It was uh, Vicky, myself, our son, and his friend, 18-year-old boys, which can only go wrong. And it did, but that's fine. <laughs> you know, the second race, Vicky's sister's like, hey, can I get those, do this with you? And the team just gradually started to grow. And then, you know, we did so well with one car at our first race. How hard can it be? Let's bring two cars to the second race. So, you know. <laughs> what a disaster. Yeah. And then we, you know, beat our heads against the wall and did like everybody else. But we started a podcast right after that. It shows our progression from, you know, zero to hopefully hero someday. As the logo says, we're in training. We'll always be in training. And we're just at a a little better than just starting training level. We literally documented everything that went right, everything that went wrong. What to do and what not to do. Yeah, I think that's what it ended up turning into. It was like, this is what we did and it went horribly wrong. So don't do this. (laughs) Every time that we did this, it was like, okay, what did we do wrong? What did we do right? And then what can we do better for the next race? And then it just started to build off of that. And then we start incorporating our stories and then it just got really funny for a while. And that's a common thread across the motorsports community, especially in the grassroots world, like we're all a part of. I mean, you look at Jim Tramontano with No Money Motorsports, it's a very yep. similar thing, right? Changing parts in the parking lot of his apartment on his Miata, and that's grown into another thing. And you see that across the board. So, yeah, I mean, we all, I guess, suffer silently in a way doing the same things. But when you're starting out new, it's extremely difficult to turn to somebody and go, now, what do I do next? How do I even get off the block? So mm-hmm. I commend you guys for taking that step to say, look, follow us on this journey and, you know, we'll show you where we've been and where we're going. Mm-hmm. We were lucky in that we found the Everyone Racers podcast and we, we wrote a letter. Well, I wrote a letter to them and I think it had like 27 bullet points and each one had sub bullet points. So they pick on me constantly about it, but they invited me on and said, hey, could you represent somebody who's trying to get into the sport? And I'm like, well, yes, yes, I can. Because we were. We got along and for some reason they said, hey, when you go to your race, because they live fairly close to us, meet us at the paddock and we'll kind of shepherd you. So the generosity of their team, which has been racing for 10 years and has won championships and races and virtually every Mm -hmm. award in Lemons, for them to share that with us, to welcome us into a sport. And we were just some guy who wrote an email. We had no way of returning that, but we thought maybe the podcast could do that. And since that time, we have gotten to a point and we have done it a few times for some teams and and taken them on their first ride with us. And we've done it a lot for a lot of the drivers that race with us. Almost all of them are friends. I don't think we've ever had like a true arrive and drive that we didn't know, but we, we invite friends and we try and get people going. And we've gotten over, I think the last time I counted, it was like 23 drivers into a race with our team. 
we call them the, our sister team. We kind of look at them like a 2.0. They kind of do a little bit of a higher level podcast than us. But our podcast is just basically getting you from your sofa to the racetrack. As it's, it says in the intro. It's, a, it's a strictly a 101. And it's actually harder to do that than when you're at the racetrack, you start getting into it. Because like Bill said, you don't know the jargon. You don't know what your buildup is. You don't even know what your basic necessities are going to be because that's not really taught. I think we actually did like a 10 part series on these are the basics to get you from your sofa to the track, what your basics on your car, what your basics of your paddock are, what your basics of your garage are, basic things that you're going to need at the track, basic safety gear, just so you can start your build of your team. And get to your first race and have fun because mm -hmm. that's the that's the most important part is I don't know that you'll agree, but the most important part of our sport and the best part of our sport is you don't have to win to have fun. In certain cases with an endurance race, especially winning is being able to start and finish. I don't know, man. I got to drive flat out for that $5 plastic trophy. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, you, you come to our team and I will buy you trophies just to get you to <laughs> mellow out, man. So, you know. <laughs> Is Here, a here's a trophy slow yeah. down we got a long <laughs> way to go <laughs> so you mentioned before i don't know that it applies to humans in the sense of theseus's ship right replacing all mm -hmm. your parts to be compatible with sports but you had a lot of things to choose from i mean you could have gone and played chess or you know i yeah. don't know make make jigsaw puzzles or something but why cars was there something that was always there lurking in the background about cars that you were interested in so I was I was born at a very young age, and in Alabama. <laughs> I mean, what are we talking about here? I was, I was very very small when I was born. The first job that I can remember, my mom was working at a toy company called Topper Toys, which used to compete with Matchbox and Hot Wheels, and obviously did a great job because they no longer exist. So she would bring home little Topper Toy Hot Wheels. And, you know, I had the Johnny Lightning case, and that was basically based on Al Unzer. So I was a car boy from very young. And I liked cars, but school, family, work, things got in the way. So we kind of put things off. And then Vicky and I eventually got to a point where the children were old enough to participate with us, our, our oldest son and our youngest daughters getting there soon. But they were at an age where they might become part of it or appreciate it or at least tolerate it. And we had enough time and uh, stupidity to do this. So we thought we'd give it a run. And, you know, how hard can it be, you know? Famous last the, words. Yeah, yeah you, you can make it as hard or as easy as you deem to be. It's kind of like we were talking to somebody today at work and he's like, well, how expensive it is? I, well, I'm like, you can race a, you know, a, a 1990s Miata or some other lower price car and your consumables aren't very high. Or you can race a challenge Ferrari dedicated full racetrack. So you can basically spend whatever you want to. But on the low side, there's it's not that It's bad. like vacation. You can spend as much as you want or as little as you want. You're still going to have a good time. I usually answer that question cheaper than guns, planes, and boats, and golf sometimes too. So take sometimes, pick. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. it's really whatever you want to put in. Racing is more than willing to take, but you have to control yourself. You know, a spec series, there's a limit to how much you can spend essentially because there's only so much you can do. But I know people who try to win the spec series and they end up buying 10 or 12 motors and taking them apart and measuring everything and keeping the ones that they want and selling the others. That's not really what we're doing. We're, we're there to challenge ourselves and improve mm -hmm. and get better. That's the other thing we've done with the podcast since we started was not only to get people started, but to help other people who are friends or soon to be friends, because everybody in racing is a friend eventually, to get better. So every episode, I always try to have part of the episode where we give you some little it could be significant or it could be this little nugget or it could be this little tip like using electrical tape on a harness okay. to help everything get lined up when you're putting it in so you can color code things because pit stops can suck when you start having to grope around trying to figure out where the harness go. You know, there's things like that and little trips and ticks that we've picked up over the years doing things or learned from other friends and nothing is new, but we can share. And the other thing too is, is about our team. We're really heavily focused on the journey more than we are on trying to race to get to that win. We bring people along, like Bill said, on that journey. With that, we've brought people into the sport that have stayed or have been interested in staying. And that's mm -hmm. another thing, too, is that Bill especially has always been a way more the merrier and just come along and enjoy this. We've never really been focused about the win, but we've been focused on our HPDEs, our precision on getting better. Skid more pads. than Yeah, skid pads, you know, mini autocross. I mean, I, I mean, we would travel 10 hours to go to an HPDE just so we can experience 
that track and then we did would you do it pick... with or without music during the the toe podcast <laughs> triple, triple speed podcasts that's we'll right yeah. that's right exactly i, I tuned so, it out I... we have a mind-blowing like 12 hour toe to ncm where basically yeah. we could get two radio stations and we opted to turn the radio off if anybody knows Brad, we didn't talk a whole lot for that 12 hours. <laughs> when we would travel, we would travel with my sister's RV. We would drive two cars and we would tow the third car because we would go out as a family, as a team. We would do this and we'd do one away race, you know, from the very eastern tip of Pennsylvania. We'd go all the way up into Michigan just so we can go experience Gingerman. It would always be like smoking the bandit with this troop because we would all be following the trailers and the people that were driving would shoot off and go get food and come back and you know everybody's got radios in their cars and it was it's really kind of exciting bill and vicky it would be unfair if we didn't ask you some pit stop questions along the way so since bill talked about you know his advanced age i would normally ask our guests <laughs> you know what poster did you have on your wall as a kid and in this case it's probably a model a ford so <laughs> a little, little after that <laughs> i know exactly what it is so I'm oh, oh is I'm ready. it please tell me go ahead what uh, is the car that is on the wall? Faucet, no, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Whatever well, she was not, sitting on. <laughs> a chariot. I'm not that old. Thank you very much. I believe anyway. she was part of the Mustang 2 campaign. I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, the Malays yeah. era Fords, right? Yeah, there's Malays there for sure. It would be from the mid 80s to Ferrari GTO oh, was, the, the was the car. Exactly. Nice. I won't say that it was a single picture of a car only on my wall at that time, but you know, that's fine. For me, I... Uh, I actually am uh, your Pinto. Yeah, no, no, um, <laughs> no. I'm actually the art girl. When I got in here, I was actually we were actually doing the artwork on the cars. But I'm the tomboy in my family, so it was just an artsy tomboy is what I was, and somehow I just kind of fell into racing with him. But now I'm training to be the mechanic. <laughs> so nothing uh, wrong you, with that. No, you were no. the one who introduced us to uh, Top Gear, though. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and my sister are usually were the ones that work on a livery until, you know, I took a turn into we need a second mechanic. So I kind of fell into that role. Richard, Jeremy, Jeremy. or James. Who, who would you rather have a beer with? Jeremy. Jeremy or Chris. Oh, from New Top Gear. Yeah, those would nice. be the two for me. Jeremy would be hilarious. <laughs> I think I would have the I, most fun talking to Jeremy, honestly. But anyway. I think the most interesting would be May. But I would yeah. also... Feel like um, I need to take it. All three, please. But you know, there's a there's a <laughs> test at the end of it or something. If you're, if you're with James May, <laughs> then it takes like ten hours. Mm-hmm. Jeremy would be um, the one that gets you in trouble all the time. He's that guy at the bar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we noted from some of the pics on your website that you did not actually choose to race the Ferrari 288 GTO, <laughs> but instead you went with the blue ovals. It looks like it's, there's a Fox body. It's close. You know, there's a proper Capri, <laughs> which is one of Eric's favorite cars for mm-hmm. some <laughs> God awful reason. None of that rebadged nonsense from the eighties. Uh, okay. Passes a Fox body, but continue. <laughs> so in a sport where everybody's budget consensus is driving a Miata, why are you all driving Fords and how are they working out for you? Well, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> Those were early pictures. <laughs> Those were early pictures, yeah. So you're saying yeah. on racetrack, dead. Dead, yeah. Or <laughs> sure owners daily. repair daily, yeah. Very early on, the cars definitely had problems. Mustang still runs. Yeah, it does. It's rough, though. We always had a struggle with the fact that it was a turbo. The it turbo was the rate. one-year GT turbo, not the SVO. So it was that one yeah. year in between, and parts are yeah. a bit of a bear there. But what you're and saying I- is they run like factory Ford's- new. Ports, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And our and our poor Capri, just for the age of it, they had these really tiny transmissions. The links would just fall off. The poor thing couldn't even handle the endurance. And people were just not giving them up because they were, seven, you know, it was, what is it, 77? 74. 70, 74. You can't find the parts for it. And those that did have them were just like, you're doing what with it? Uh, we don't think so. So <laughs> they're not giving the parts up. So we were going to do uh, a full engine swap, transmission swap, rear end swap on the Capri. And we still have all those parts if anybody's interested in, in helping and yeah. or taking over the project because it's above our pay grade at this point. We're getting there, but it's really slow to get it to is. that point. We have everything ready. We have the wiring harness good to go. We have all the parts sitting there mocked up, but you know, not having ever built engine mounts and other details that we haven't even gotten to yet. It's a little past what our skill level is. It's, yeah. it's something we'd like to do, but I just don't know that we're ever going to get there because we keep breaking the other stuff we use all the time. So yeah, there's that. But then we fell into a Chevy S10. 
Ooh. which which I got to tell you was uh, the thing is like a Lego. It really is. It's so easy to work on. We've been really successful with it, but we're pretty much are outgrowing it at this point. So um, what year? S10. Just... 2003. Yeah. Oh, so it's a 4.3 liter or the mm-hmm. four cylinder? Yeah. Four three. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So and the car just runs like a clock. It's just one of the difficulties we have is not buying the car, but selling the car. So I tended to <laughs> buy cars and we yes. had to downsize a little bit so have you yeah. seen eric's driveway uh, it's I, yeah I, I might i might be close yeah i widened it it's helipad size for a reason I'm oh just my saying. gosh it's yeah it's, instead of getting rid of cars he just made his driveway bigger 100 percent uh, true yeah <laughs> instead of getting rid of cars i got a second hanger at the airport (laughs) yeah he legitimately did but now we're kind of cleaning house because the problem with hubby here is that there were a lot of recommendations for cars and he was buying all of them so (laughs) so now um the porsche came through and a porsche is its own beast i kind of looked at it was intimidated by just the compactness of the engine area and how that was in there and i'm like i just you have small hands it's fine it's Hans, small Hans. Tiny small Hans. Hans, yes. So we went through some Porsches. We went through some versions of the BMW, the Miatas. We had the truck. We had the earlier versions of the cars of the Ford, Mustang, and the Caprice. Settled on the race truck. And now we are into a 1993 Honda, which Civic. it's a very cool little car. Now our team has to learn how to drive a front wheel. So yes, our specialty. No, yeah. <laughs> so so I had to. I went out for my first race with it. I did not get a chance to prep myself with it very well. But I had to keep telling myself when I was driving, when I was going into my apex, was that it is a pull, not a push. And once I had to keep memorizing that it's a pull, not a push, is what the car is doing with the front end. So I was able to to get on the gas earlier and not have to worry about spinning out in those certain areas. There's two rules to driving a fun wheel drive. Mm-hmm. Lift your foot to turn mm-hmm. and when in doubt, throttle out. That's mm-hmm. right. That's right. I, exactly. That so. worked perfectly until it snowed about three quarters of an inch in one yeah. lap when she was on the yes. track and didn't matter. <laughs> I've actually autocrossed a couple Hondas from that generation and they are fantastic cars. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. in the autocross world, they are subject to the same downfall as Miata's, which means 275 square and they look like little roller skates. So they don't handle mm-hmm. exactly like the track cars do. That's that's 100% for mm-hmm. sure. So is that all there is in the fleet right now? Oh, he's shaking his no. head no. No, I just sold my... We're um, divesting. Yeah, I just sold my Miata Turbo. It had a fly Miata in it. I was a little sad to see it go, but for that particular vehicle, I was pigeonholed with it because it was too street for track and too track for street. Because sold it to the, a friend. Sold it to a friend. Because of the age, I'm just at that point when I'd rather be in a more comfortable car to go, but I actually have a spec one that looks exactly like it coming up behind that I'm building next after i get all these other vehicles out of the way bill's got a e46 that he just had built we haven't primed it yet we haven't had a chance to prime it yet but that's in the hangar ready to go we have an e46 m3 for daily yes. and a nd miata 2019 and they're hpdes and we do those those are kind of our, our light hpds and then we have a essentially a endurance version of a spec e46 for endurance so it's not technically a spec e46 but we don't care about hardware so as long as they let us go on a track i don't care it's not for like a lemons race that's more like a AER type of thing. yeah and, and then we have the honda civic for our lemons car we have a honda fit which vicky hates but that's okay she hasn't run sunday cup yet with grid life which we will be doing yeah. shortly vicky's got a spec miata coming around because she's about to enter the higher level hpdes and maybe start doing time mm-hmm. trials and time attacks doing her hb3 and 4 but mostly with nasa great lakes so having a caged car is always in our mind preferred when you get to the higher levels mm-hmm. so you peaked my ears when you said fit so that begs the question be spec yes, racing yes yeah exactly be spec in sunday cup we're taking it out first for the uh, lemons rally up in uh, the fail foliage which is boston to boston and I'm running it with my mom and my sister. So that's going to be first be, though. No. So you guys would probably be the only people to answer this pissed stop question with a yes, which is, would you drive a Chevy Spark? It's got wheels, right? <laughs> <laughs> give anything a shot with wheels. <laughs> Everybody's like, why don't you ride motorcycles? I'm like, because I would like them. And yeah. I know what I do on a car. So I don't want to do a motorcycle. 
Uh, that's like that's it. the same reasoning I have. That's why I'm not allowed on two wheels. Exactly. So what are your successes and failures in the Enduro series you run? In spite of our lack of trying, we actually won a race one time in our class. We won C class for Lemons Racing. I don't know what she's going to think her. I know what I think her biggest accomplishments are, but I think the most recent one for me was uh, working my way to HPD4 and then getting my MSF level two instructor certification and, and starting to give back to everybody and, and going out and teaching as many people as I can. It's been fun. It's challenging because I always have one student dedicated for usually an HPD1. Then we always have friends and teammates there. So I end up doing HPD1, HPD2, HPD3, and then driving some of those people in my HPD four classes. And then at the end of the day, Vicky's like, why are you so tired? And I'm just like, so I didn't get out of a car. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's kind of fun. I don't know what's your accomplishment, Miss Vicky. What are you proud of? Do you have lots I, to be proud of? I, well, or, not- or biggest oops moment, you know, biggest learning uh, moment in there. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> Code Brown moments. Those are my favorite. <laughs> Always make sure that your tires are tightened with their lug nuts. <laughs> There's Bill, that. yes, just episode six. Is it 69? 68. 68, episode 68 on our podcast. Guys, go listen to it. It's absolutely hilarious. Bill <laughs> lost a tire on the race truck, but it ended up in such a fiasco because it wasn't on the racetrack. It was on the road, mm-hmm. and it wasn't supposed to be on the road, and he was nope. trying to sneak it from point A to point B. Oh, I was told it would be fine. No, yeah. It was less than fine. Yes, that that was... Short story, it ended up hitting a house after jumping (laughs) uh, Armco, three bushes, a tree. It hit the house, but it didn't just hit the house. It hit the house right where the gas meter is and broke the gas meter and the gas pipe. And then that was the beginning of the avalanche of incredible... Yes, because they had to... Dig Everybody. it up all the way to the street to repair yes. it, Across and the street. and for Bill trying to get out there at like seven o'clock in the morning to kind of sneak this thing from like into two towns over to a shop without having it registered to be on the road, it ended up having two fire trucks, an ambulance, it ended up. Yeah, great. and then we actually, the cop came late because he was really angry because he hit a deer with his new police car on the way in. So <laughs> and this thing just went on and apparently the gas line was grandfathered in. So they actually had to dig it all the way up to the street to repair it because they went to go turn it off and they couldn't turn it off because the thing broke off in their hand in the ground. It was... <laughs> Wow. And actually, at the very end of this whole scenario, as my husband keeps trying to call me and, I, and I'm and i not available to him to talk to me, at the very end, he's the cop offered to give him a ride and Bill's like, to where? Front seat or back seat? <laughs> and he calls me at the end of it. He says, the, the way the day went, as long as I'm not in a striped suit, I'm good. <laughs> the way it went. So yeah, it was just an absolute fiasco. We have stories like that in our journey of this whole scenario with cars. I think that was our biggest ups. Learning what it takes, what the difference between prepping a car for driving on the road and prepping a car for a race and after a race. Torquing the lug nuts is the same regardless. Just want to point that out for our audience. Yes. (laughs) True. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That goes back to another problem we had was we had so many people who none of us knew what we were doing, but we had so many people trying to help. We had to come up so with so many ways. hands on the car that we didn't. The left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. That, that's Did you torque the lug nuts? Of course, I took the lug nuts, but I didn't know that somebody else had taken the wheel off and then not put them all the way on. Yep. So we got I lots. Think my of big to do. oops was the uh, car trailer falling off the hitch when I was driving down the highway. That was a joy, and it was nighttime coming out of New Hampshire all the way down to. Eastern Pennsylvania, I had lost all electricity in the back of the vehicle because it broke the plug. Mm. And as I'm sitting on the side of the road, everybody's like, well, you don't have the right ball for your truck because our ball got stolen. And Bill went out and bought a ball for it, but it didn't fit properly. We didn't know that. So it ended up, I hit a bump and the whole thing just, it lifted off the ball and it just starts skidding behind me on its chains. I'm like, I can't drive this any further. They're like, well, we can get you so far. And then the people were still leaving lemons and, you know, for the whole repair thing, it's like doing what they could do to help me. And then my sister out of the blue, just, she's in a whole different vehicle and she's been gone. She just kind of pops her head around. She goes, Hey there. 
And I'm like, what are you doing here? And then of course my brother-in-law is great at doing electrical work. So he's sitting there, pulls the whole thing apart, repairs it right there on the side of the road in the dark, <laughs> right? And I'm just like, you guys are godsend. But I'm sitting there panicking on the side of the road, looking at this thing. And she's like, hi there, what are you doing? And I'm oh. like, oh, God, thank you. It's like the, you know, a beam of light as I looked at her face, like the sun had come out. Jeff gave you a ball, I think. Yeah, right he times. did. But we couldn't drive it because it was dark and it had no lights on the trailer. And I'm like, I can't drive this thing without somebody possibly hitting me or I'm going to get pulled over constantly as I start going back from, you know, the next 300 miles, 400 miles. I'm like, you know, what am I going to do? And I'm like, oh, right. Speaking of trailer incident, knock on wood, hopefully there'll never be a third. I've had two incidents where, you know, you, you on a Sunday morning, you come back from the hotel and now, you know, mm -hmm. now we do a lot more camping and you line your truck up with the tongue because you're going to eventually just hitch up and, you know, load your car yep. or whatever. Right. Then inevitably something happens, you pop a motor or whatever, and your friends are like, okay, we'll help you push the car onto the trailer. Yeah. And at the second that the front wheels hit the ramp, somebody goes, wait, did you hook it to the truck? And <gasps> you watch it come uh, up yeah. and slam down. And luckily, twice, it has not hit my truck and destroyed the back of it. So uh. Ben Dawson, who does our Domine with Dawson's with us, he's a friend that we've never actually met in person. He did that, <laughs> but the trailer stayed tilted and then started rolling. Oh, no. Like through the paddock towards the... That's <laughs> yeah. It yeah went, it, always it chop towards, your wheels yeah towards the building that was mm -hmm. you know like yeah clubhouse it, it was awesome it had enough it was done yeah i think my wins to answer that question would have to be how much i learned in the garage over the last couple of years of doing this i have learned that i am a physical worker and not a desk worker that's where i find my most joy i've picked up the mechanical stuff really fast and i've learned how to do livery and painting vehicles now just wrapping. yeah wrapping cars now i'm able to pick up on the mechanical stuff like really fast so now we're working on fabricating and our next project right now is fiberglassing it's like my happy place right now is in the garage if, like if i get a day off and get to go down there it's like you know, my mechanics come in in town too so you know even better because we can really bang the work out and we just we have a good time down there i look forward to those days you guys mentioned you race in a ton of different series. So can we talk about the differences in the series and which you like better, worse, and why? I don't know if we do a ton. We, we've done a couple. Um, a few more than yeah. you. So I've always had this idea, and I'm an engineer, so sorry. But I, I was going to plot the fun factor versus the true racer factor. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of plot the different series in terms of what they stress and, and what they... What their characters are. Right. So like when we started with the HPDs, we spent one year and we just sampled nine or 10 different HPD groups to find out what we wanted, what was the right blend. And it's the same thing with the racing series. You can go to a series which is emphasizes the fun and not so much the racing, or you can get some that are more intermediate on both, or you can get some that are, that are very, very serious and very pro-am racing type series. So you, you kind of got to realize a couple things where you are in your progression as a driver and where you want to be and you may not start in the series you want to race in eventually and you may get more serious with time or you may get less serious with time and it just depends on where your happy spot is because there's different groups within the different series that go across because you know sometimes you want to have a you know i want to see what we can do weekend and sometimes you just want to go and have a great weekend with some friends and you can mm -hmm. find a series for that so like lemons is kind of the default not terribly serious racing, still good drivers. And a lot of the impressions that people get are from old lemons races when they were kind mm -hmm. of a joke and safety wasn't anything, but could be probably one of the highest level safety series that they have just due to the cars that they allow. I kind of look at lemons like playing football with your friends on a Sunday mm -hmm. when you were younger. You go out there, you have a good time. And then afterwards you go have some beers and you just, you have fun. There is, you know, serious play when your guys are playing, but there's also people that are just, you know, I'm here to hang with my buds. And then you've got champ car, which is similar types of cars they're all car shaped as opposed to lemons can get a little fancy with the shapes a little more serious probably the same level and then the next series up i i think i probably put lucky dog there you know if we only lived on the west coast they'd be like perfect for us because they're the perfect balance and to fit our needs of serious racing good driving and a lot of fun in the paddock and kathy runs a great series and uh, unfortunately they're mostly on the the left coast 
but whenever she comes east coast we always do some and we've traveled out to race with her a couple times out west next you probably have something like aer it's a little more racy better cars tend to go a little faster some true race cars there are some pro teams that are doing their practices there to get some more time and cost effectively and the racing's quite good then you probably go wrl would be above that and then imsa i think i might have left somebody well, out there, there's a there's a step in between imsa and wrl that's for sure there's, and that's a row. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. You're right. And but then, of and course, there's, there's grid life coming. We're going to go to our first two events, maybe mm-hmm. three events. If rumors are true, we may go to three events this year. But grid life has uh, been on the list, and we, we think we uh, like to have some fun there with the Sunday Cup and the HBD. So we're going to go out there and, and bring our fit and go mm-hmm. Sunday cupping, get Miss Vicky out there on the track a little bit for that, and then maybe some HBDs. And sometimes we might just go just to you know walk around with a microphone and a podcast and get a couple episodes with people we've talked yep. to and maybe meet them in person and say hi here's a shirt. We owe you stuff for coming on, you know? (laughs) Thank you. Swag. If you ever need a pitch hitter, you know, front wheel drive guy, just let me know, you know? (laughs) Always. Door is open, man. You just got to let us know because, you know, we're not terribly popular in terms of, you know, if you look at the world, there's like 8 billion people and most of them don't listen. Um, <laughs> you know, with four seats at a race that they fill up pretty quick, especially when, you know, Vicky never gives up one and she's always looking for the, the ladies team. So, you know, sometimes I get the boot, but that's okay. That's why I'll just buy another car. Yeah, we're well. actually, this next race we're going into NJMP, we're putting in an all girls team. And second I, time. Yeah, second time. The first time was quite interesting. I was the team mechanic and I had another girl who was savvy with mechanical work. I mean, not great. And the rules were for our team was that we could ask for diagnosis if we need assistance, but we had to put the hands on our cars, which we got it to about 85%. Sometimes the guys just really wanted to touch a car. I'm like, no, 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 you can't touch a car. That's the rule. But I got to tell you, my girls, two of them, this was their, this was their very first race. And it was whoop, 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 girl power till seven (laughs) o'clock. I said, the work starts after dinner. (laughs) <laughs> because then you got to prep the car for the next day. So I was like, this girl power stuff is not working right now. So this new race that we're coming, they now better understand that we got paddock work to do. They stayed off site. I, I think both of you know, staying off site, you know, after a day of racing, it's yeah, it's painful it's and tiring. And yeah. Day. And you know what? They were autocrossers. So they, they didn't understand that for endurance racing, that there's a series of things that you must do in the evening to prep your car for the next day, especially if things weren't going right. And of course, at that point, I had thrown all the shims in the, the driver's side. So we had to go ahead and lay new shims in the Steering car. Shims. Yeah. So we had some issues we had to fix, but we got it done. Just like our show, in a way, there's two sides to it, right? There's two sides to garage years and training. There's the racing side of this, which we've been talking mm-hmm. quite extensively about. But I think I want to circle back and talk about the podcast a little bit more. Mm-hmm. So like our format, it seems like you guys have a bunch of different sub arcs to the show. And maybe not everybody realizes that. And it's not just about wrench turning and mishaps like we've been talking about so far. Why don't you tell us about the show format itself and maybe some of your more notable guests and special reoccurring episodes and things like that. And especially now after you guys are celebrating over 300 episodes. We did a, uh, a re-intro of ourselves for 300 episodes just because we realized that, you know, it's been several years since we started and hopefully people don't go back and listen to our first few episodes because, you know, they're Hard. Oh, ours are tragically terrible. Too. <laughs> They're so bad. They're so yeah. bad. We can't decide if our first podcast episodes are the worst thing or our first on track driving videos are worse. We they're they're oh, very the close. Video. <laughs> You know, I've seen some shows, and I'm going to call them out like Sinisterhood. They took down a lot of their early episodes. They kept some of the good ones in there. But I'm like, you know what? I'm not embarrassed. Everybody's got to start somewhere. And Well, you know, I think if you do it, in our instance, it gives people like, you know what? There is a starting point. And we all were bad at one point. Yeah, there's a realness to it. You see the quality change of the quality of the guests change, all of that, right? So, And and my uh, comic book collector could not throw out any episodes, you know, because, you know, I wouldn't have a complete set. So. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and what, what's the trivia question? You've only missed one episode, so I've got you I beat there. I have not missed a single episode yet. Well, they, they recorded one while I was on a flight to Hawaii for work. So. <laughs> I just reschedule everything, so then they can't. I know. Well, we didn't out. realize we could get ahead so far, and, and that, nice. that was uh, episode two, I think. So. so we started out pre-plague. In the before uh, times. Yeah. So back in the day, you know, way back, we were essentially documenting our growth as a team. Eventually, we started having infrequent guests and we're learning how to do podcasts and everything about we it. We didn't really have guests on that much in the beginning anyway. No, maybe maybe once no. every 
couple months during the plague, we weren't racing as much as we wanted to. And we rapidly realized it's very tough to report on how we're doing at the racetrack when we're not going to the racetrack. So we started looking for... Not even leaving our houses. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> we started looking for guests to help us and help our audience learn about a topic. So to get a little better, because we had some downtime and we thought we'd, we'd assist with that. And we have questions. So if we think of a question we, somebody else has as well. We're not that smart. So we'll go find somebody who can know. So if we know nothing about shocks, so we'll go find somebody mm -hmm. you know uh, who knows something about that. Or we know nothing about anything. We just, what's it like to run We're just HPD? educating ourselves. Right. And hopefully our audience will get better and learn. So then it turned into, it's kind of a blend right now where we'll do infrequent episodes about our team and we do mostly guests. The guests episodes are kind of an intro to the guests with some history so that they uh, can be known by our audience because some of our audience is brand new and they may not know who Paul Gerard, the stig on American Top Gear, they may not know who he is or some other race drivers or some people that are well known, but you know we didn't know. So we'll do an intro to kind of get our audience familiar with it. Then we'll go into the topics, which are going to be one or two. And then we'll end an episode with like what we call the Fast and Furious story time questions, which are like a series of questions that just go on and on and on and ask absolutely stupid little trivia things. Sort of like our pit stop. Exactly. I always wanted to have the episodes have something that would help somebody get better. So we eventually we met Ben Dawson at one of our podcasts with uh, Race Mark. And we just kind of hit it off and, and he's a really good driver and he's also an instructor. And we said, hey, would you do a, a segment? We started brainstorming. We ended, ended up coming with, with Dominating with Dawson because the big joke about lemons is always we're going to dominate. So, you know, we thought it was funny. And then we were going to do one of those every episode, but our episodes can go long. I mean, we've gone over three hours. It's not for the lighthearted. So when you start doing that and then you start doing a Dominate with Dawson, which was originally going to be like a five or 10 minute thing, but then we start digressing, which is basically the same word. If you look in the dictionary under digression, there's the word podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so the episodes started creeping up to where they were averaging like two and a half hours. So it was like, oh, wait a minute. Why don't we have a normal podcast on Monday? And then we'll have Dominate with Dawson's on Tuesday. And then if we have more, if we have a Wood episode, because we're Garage Heroes in Training named after superheroes. So we start reprinting movies or pop culture things. So we'll have we love Wednesday's kind of pop movies. We had to have the boots. Yeah. So, you know, we're going to have one coming out on uh, the recent Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness movie. We'll have mm -hmm. one of those. And, uh, you know, we try to tell you in the title what's coming. So if you don't care about Doctor Strange and it says Woot Doctor Strange, you can skip. We've done as many as eight episodes in a week because we did a one where we followed the a Lemons Rally or we were supposed to do one for the uh, one lap with the Sunday Cups. We were trying to get those guys, but we couldn't track them down and, you know, schedules. So we'll do series all the time. We did a GLTC series with Grid Life and tried to get as many Grid Life people on there and see what GLTC was. Because that's kind of like one of those bucket list items for me is to eventually get to where I'm not dead last in Grid Life for GLTC. That would be nice. I have the car. I just don't have the skill. We'll work on it. Mm -hmm. And then we do our Fast and Furious questions because we just think they're fun to figure out a little bit more the person about the person in general. And they find it fun, too, because they're, asked, they're, they're kind of reliving some of their history on the podcast, which is pretty cool. You'll know them soon enough, you two. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Notable guests, as I look through your catalog, people like Ross Bentley and Randy Popes and Mike Skeen and others. Even on your trivia episode, the 300th episode, part of the questions were, you know, who's been on the show the most and who was our first guest and things like that. So quite the list in the catalog of 300 episodes to go back and review and, and hear those interviews. So anybody you want to give us a sneak peek, maybe a little spoiler of somebody else that's coming along down the line? If Other anybody knows us, us, I mean, come on. Well, you know. I mean, you yeah. know, once, when we started the podcast, I, I sat there and, and, you know, I think Vicky and I talked about our team for weeks trying to figure out what to name it. And when we started the podcast, I, I sat there and said, looking back after we're done or have done this podcast for a few years, what would be cool people to have had on the podcast? And, and we're probably close to halfway through our original list. You know, some of the people who have said yes, we're shocked with. And some of the people who we thought, yeah, that would be a nice one to start with. <laughs> they don't even respond to us. It really varies. And the, the thing that I find that's incredibly surprising and satisfying is some of the bigger name people that we've had were the easiest and the most welcoming. Like mm -hmm. when you have in training in your podcast name, the ultimate guest for you would be somebody like Ross Bentley, right? And we called him up and said, we'd like to celebrate our hundredth episode with you because, you know, 
you're kind of what we're trying to do. He's like, sure. And then he had so much fun. He's like, he comes on every 50 episodes now, like every single time. So, you know, somebody like Ross, who's, you know, world renowned racing coach, author, great speaker. He's got more than enough things on his agenda that he doesn't need to talk to our little podcast. But every 50 episodes like clockwork. Ross is on there. He pretends to have fun. We're happy to say be no. I think he's happy to be there. You know, <laughs> he sounds it like if he's, he's happy. Not. Yeah. So <laughs> I think Randy was a guilt trip because Randy Popes we had on there the first time we were out in a lucky dog race in Portland, and he had always wanted to run he's the car so that we nice. were renting. He is, yeah, and seat stealer. But um, seat stealer. That's what he is. I'm a metrics guy, so we figured we'll let Randy go out in the car. And we'll know what the car can do. <laughs> and then we'll see what we do relative to that. We'll see how much we need. But to it do. was a rented car. It was. It was. for four That laps. was built in a week. Yes, for four laps. And then it blew up. So Randy blew up our car. Not any fault of his. But, you know, when Randy's in a car, he's going to get the most out of it. So we pushed the car to the limit. And we found it. But it was just a little bit more. Just so you know, Randy will drive in your car if you ask him. But you no better doubt. make sure that your car can handle it because he will burn your car if you are not careful. You want to find a weak spot? Randy's your guy. He'll he help you with fi- setup and everything. Your- he felt really bad that the car broke because we had flown out to Portland for the race. He's like, is there anything I can do? I said, you know, it'd be awesome is if you came on the podcast because, you know, you're one of the the reason my son's into racing is Randy. You know, Head to Head is one of my favorite racing shows of all time with him and Jason and uh, Johnny. Two guests that have said yes, but haven't come on yet. They're coming. So he came on and it was great. And then I realized in you know, 45 minutes into the episode that the uh, microphone had um, disconnected and we had the laptop sitting on the other side of the room and it was recording through the laptop speaker and there was nothing yeah. I could do about it. And I was like, oh my God, but Randy's such a nice guy. He came on again to do it. And, you know, mm-hmm. he's been on three times, I think. So. And you know, that's actually a great segue in the fact that prepping for a podcast and doing all that post work isn't too different than the prep and paddock work that it takes Mm -hmm. when we're at the racetrack. What are some tips and tricks, things you guys have learned over the years that would be beneficial to somebody that's first starting out getting into this hobby? There's so many things that you have to do to run a race team and to run a race weekend. Could be an HPD weekend, could be a racing weekend, could be anything. You're going to forget something and nothing drives me battier than forgetting something and then needing it through lots of pain on my part, mentally self-inflicted pain. We have checklists for everything. I have a checklist for an HPD weekend. I have a checklist for packing for a race weekend. I have packing lists for the toolboxes that we have. We have packing lists for the trailer. We have packing lists for the paddock and all the food prep. We have lists for each night what we do to the car to prep for the next day. We have whiteboard for scheduling the weekend with Uh things that we need now. We call it the runner. Somebody has to go out and get us apart or go out and get us brake clean. I think Alan lives on brake clean. He goes through brake clean like it's nobody's business. (laughs) We get our driving order. We know who's going to do radios. We know who's going to do the primary mechanic. We know who's going to do all the different steps that are part of the team, who's going to prep lunches and dinners. and, And then organization. Exactly. I mean, he said he was an engineer. Are you sure you're not in the aviation industry? I mean, do you have a checklist for checklists? Might as well be at NASA. I mean, you you don't subscribe to the whole just run it until it breaks and then you know what's broken? You can. The most expensive race you have is the one where it breaks on the first lap. Dollars per mile. You you didn't do very well that weekend. So, you know, Mm -hmm. we aren't. But how many smiles were in that mile, though? Exactly. Well, it's only one driver. Well, it's only one. (laughs) Only one driver. (laughs) Don't concern ourselves terribly with how the race works out, especially endurance racing. And we don't care about winning the HPD fastest lap trophy, but we do care about the amount of time and energy and prep that we've done to be ready to get the maximum enjoyment out of it. And, you know, the biggest thing we had when I went to our first race even was I wanted to make sure that everybody got in the car. And then once we did that, the rest of it was easy. I do do a lot of work with NASA. So, you know, I've stolen things from them and we share our lists with everybody. If you find something better, or if you find something that's missing, just let us know. And we'd love to update our list. I think I'm on it's either version 56 or 57. He's We've got, got master lists, and but they work. The, if the you stru- use them. The structure of the team is that Bill is our organizer and team leader. He will go into the garage and do a couple things, but Bill's tendency is to, I always tell him, I says, you bring a sledgehammer when you need a screwdriver. 
you're just that kind of guy. And I said, Faster. him doing the higher level for our team, which is the ordering the parts, the structure, the organization. I mean, our tool cabinets literally have slots for our tools. So we know when something's missing at the track. You lose stuff at the track. It, you right. win, it just regardless, happens. you're still going to never find your 10 millimeter socket. You, so, we have so many 10 millimeter sockets. So, so in each <laughs> in each tool cabinet, we have four spare 10, 10 millimeter sockets in each size drive. So mm -hmm. we won't have that problem. And we have spares on the side. He was always the document person on our team. And I was always the paddock girl or the garage girl. He was supposed to be doing cars and whatnot, but somehow our roles got flipped. So now he's got my job and I have the job that he was intended for. And I think we're happier that way. But he's very good at what he does and he keeps our team moving forward. And because he's, a, he's basically being the engineer, he's a systems person. He relies on systems. Our garage now has function to constantly make things easier or better or more efficient. That's how he operates with us. And we don't forget anything ever. Is the Except goal. when dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> and then you got to run to the hardware. You got to run to the store. You got to run out yeah. to the auto store. Or drive back to Scranton yeah. and come get it and then go back to pit race. That sucked, but it happened. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he's, he's really good at what he does. I do have to say, but tips are, I would have to say, or lists. I don't know. Do we have them on our website? Are they available or can they we be? We do. Requested? It might be like a, an earlier version, like 30 something. I don't know when yeah. the last time I updated it is. Even when it comes to checking your car before you get it to tech, basic stuff you need to do on your car. So how to store um, it for the winter. Those really help. And even how to pack a paddock. Like I said, just organization. Organization. If you can be organized at your race, you will have a much better race. And that includes paddock. That includes, you know, making sure that your team is properly fed and hydrated because they will be happier people if they don't have to go running around trying to find food or trying to figure out where their next meal is going to come from or who they can bum it off or somebody's going to run out and go grab a pizza. Paddock game is stronger than our driving game. Always Yeah, has we been. have a very strong paddock game right now. So come eat with us the next time we're at the same place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, definitely organization is strong. It has to be strong. I mean, that's half the battle. You can be one of the slower cars, especially if you start talking endurance racing with classes, you can be easily one of the slowest, if not the slowest, and still win the race just because your car just keeps going round and round. Speaking of the slowest cars, yep, I've right got here, a what, man. Should, what should I buy question. What should I buy as the starter track car? Let's answer this with the two different cars. Let's say one option is an HPDE car. Oh, okay. and the other is a, a race car for AER, not lemons, because you can go out and get a, a Chevy Malibu and you can run lemons all day long. All day long. <laughs> well, no, not in a Chevy Malibu. You won't run all day long, but that's, that's mm -hmm. a different story. That's not your fault. I would recommend the HPDE car first because I've seen people hop into a car that is an AER car. And it might have been more car than they could handle. Unless you have those basic skills, then yes. But our recommendation, I mean, through our trials, is that my opinion, if you're going to buy a car, is to buy one that's already been built and used. And then you can or modify it. You know, and make sure it's easy and affordable. Hondas are good. Miatas are good. They're simple to work on. Something that's not complicated. And that already has a roll cage in it and has basically the structures that are already in it. Safety always systems. tweak. Yes. Yeah. You can always tweak it and make it your own. But at least when you're starting out in a race, you really don't know what those big basics need to be to not have to worry about the intimidation of starting from scratch when you haven't done this before. It'll be harder for you to even get to the track unless you have somebody that's in the know. So we had a rule when our son was able to get driving and we had a certain prescription for what that car should be. We disagreed on how we got there, but we wanted 200 horsepower or less ish. We wanted a manual transmission to keep them off the phone. We wanted as much safety as we could afford to buy safety systems. So we ended up getting him a Toyota 86, which is a great car for him so far with the training that we did to, to help him learn how to drive, knock on wood, knock on metal, knock on anything I can find. No incidents, no accidents, no tickets. Life is good. We told him, you know, go have fun on the track, but on the street, people don't know how to drive. Take care of yourself and don't, don't die. Something similar, I think, would be a proper HPDE car to learn because I don't care if you drive 100,000 miles a year and you, as part of your job or you drive just back and forth to the grocery store. You may think of yourself as a great driver and you probably are from a road perspective, but driving on a road has nothing to do with driving on a track. 
assume it's like a totally different sport just because the, the utensil you drive is different. So think of a car that's something along the lines of that you like 200 ish horsepower, judge for yourself, change your brake pads, change your brake fluid and go have fun. Just make mm-hmm. sure it's safe. AER car, the car of choice right now seems to be a, a BMW E46. Mm-hmm. Could be some type of Porsche Cayman, could be some type of Mazda Miata. It really depends on your budget there. Especially if you're new, we always recommend buy a car that's already been built. Mm-hmm. People sell them. It's not that they're bad. It's that they chose to do something else or they chose to get out of the sport or they graduated and went to a higher level. A They've higher upgrown level. their car. Different or class. Yeah. Different mm-hmm. class. That, you know, I want to go run a spec series. There's nothing wrong with running a spec Mm -hmm. series car and you find out that, you know, you put all this money into a car that doesn't fit anywhere and it's great for endurance racing, but you want to go do spec racing and time trials. Mm -hmm. People just change and use what they've done and then modify it. I think that's the easiest way, especially if you don't have the experience and expertise to build one from the ground up. And if you're buying somebody else's race car, what is the resource of choice for you to find those cars? I'm assuming it would be racing junk. Let's bring a trailer. Bring a, bring a trailer. Didn't you know that? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Because I'm going to spend $450,000 on my Acura Integra Type R. My favorite place to go is VickyDoesn'tKnow.com. <laughs> I thought it was takeallmymoney.com. Isn't that the other one? The it, inner know, debt. It, 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 is, is, yeah. and, and then you pay for the cars that of Vicky doesn't know this bank account. <laughs> yes. Yes. I've had Dash. cars show up on trailers and I did not know they were arriving. And she was less than pleased. I was less uh, than pleased. Yes. I'm still paying for one of them right now. Not in a, not in a fiscal sense, by the way. Just, just in case Emotionally. that wasn't that wasn't clear. The bathtub is getting awfully awfully lonely um (laughs) as i sleep in there racing junk's a great one if you're fortunate enough to know people who are involved just letting them know hey i'm looking for uh you know something to do in this series or something to do in that series or or i'm looking to just get into it and it's amazing what you can find by word of mouth we have friends who race with us and you know i was saying we're probably going to get rid of vicky's car and they they helped us by finding somebody else that we knew that was looking for a car for them and their daughter to learn on and for him to have fun in facebook marketplace isn't a, isn't a terrible place either especially if it's like spec e36 spec e46 spec miata things like that the spec cars are one of the few race cars that the pricing doesn't seem to go down you can get your money in and your money out and not take a bath building a car you tend to way overspend what the end value is so let somebody else do that it's not as much fun and maybe not as cool to some but if you're trying to be fiscally responsible which using that word in racing is kind of funny you if know you try, how to make a fortune in racing right exactly start with a bigger one yeah <laughs> with, you, with you there you know that's the best plan usually we're dealing with people who are fairly new and fairly early in their career that is somebody we wouldn't recommend build your own we'd recommend get one maybe your second car or third car don't do what we did (laughs) so i think i would dovetail off that there's a couple things racing junk is a great place to start however asterisk caveat comma make sure that whatever you buy off of there whether it's a spec car or not comes with a logbook because a car with Mm -hmm. a logbook is worth its weight in gold you can get into different series if you decide you don't want to do endurance racing and you want to go to nasa club racing or scca or something else the car is already certified right after that point you just got to follow the rest of the rules and go from Mm -hmm. there i think i would diverge a little bit from the build versus buy I've always attested to build because I grew up in a household where we swapped a lot of cars. We did a lot of crazy projects. We've had cars in magazines, stuff like that. So I find those projects to be a lot of fun and I take a lot of pride in what I've built. So I know there's a, there's a lot of petrol heads out there that are into that and I don't want to dissuade them. I don't want to say, yeah, oh, no, no. But understand. If you're, if it's you're a, a petro hole. head, then definitely if you have the skills to do it, yeah. You can do that. You might be spending more to do it than what the car is worth, like Bill said. But if sure. you enjoy doing it and you have skills on doing that, then yes. But I mean, our audience are people that are just like literally on the sofa and they don't know anything. Wow. I got you. I got you. You know, and that's gonna... what I'm saying for those people. You know, don't try to start from scratch if you don't have what you need. The comma asterisk caveat on that one is though, if you are going to build something, Take the time, and I know it's a cure to insomnia, but read something like the global competition rules from SCCA and look at a class that your car fits in and build to the spec. 
save yourself the money and the time that you're going to waste like I have over the years, proving that certain parts are great for the street and not for the track. And then eventually I should have just read the manual, right? RTFM. So it's really important that these sanctioning guidelines exist so you can build towards them and still have your, you know, Reliant Robin spec car that you want to build if that's what gets you up Mm -hmm. in the morning. You can still spend the money. You can still have a lot of fun building, but make sure that you're building towards a goal. And if your goal is to go racing and not just a flashy DE car or something like that, make sure you're building towards a spec of some sort or some sort of class. And I'd like to recommend one more thing. Go to a racetrack and go visit first. So you actually can see what people have done to their cars, what's inside the cars, ask questions. People are so friendly at the racetrack. You can walk into a paddock and ask a question, probably more so not during the race when it's actually happening, unless it's a stalled paddock, but definitely after the race, they are the nicest people and they will answer any questions that you have. Take pictures. So much like we talked about driving and driving on a track as different sports, when you say people who work on cars, the work on cars and the work on a race car and prepping car are very Mm -hmm. different. So... Mm -hmm. Be very careful that you're not trying to do more than your skills would allow. Like just because you do your handy maintenance and stuff, that doesn't mean you can build a roll cage. You've got to be careful with what you're trying to do. And sometimes, especially with the safety related items, look to either a professional organization or a professional service center that will do that work for you or a very competent team that you trust because you're literally trusting your lives and your family's lives and your friends' lives in that system. So those are things you got to be careful of. And the first car to me, even if you are very mechanical with lots of experience, I would still lean towards first car, buy a car. And that's not diminishing the interest or the skill that you may have, but you learn a lot just by doing and trying it and seeing like, oh, wow, that's this car, the uh, cage, the bar and the door comes way too far down and way too far in. And I hit my head whenever I get in and I can't get my luxurious mammal friend who's on my team to get in and out of the car easily. And if there's something goes wrong, he's going to be very slow or the seat doesn't go far enough forward for my beautiful bride. You'll see things and you'll learn things. And as you learn things, then that second car, I think would be easier, especially if you are mechanical, because you're going to constantly tweak that first car, or you may start over at scratch. We bought the Honda. It was fully caged, race prepared, raced in NASA sprint race. We converted it to an endurance race. And then we found out that we didn't like certain things about it. We took the entire cage out and built a new cage. It wasn't what we wanted. We wanted to be what we view as proper. So as we get close to wrapping up our segment here, Bill and Vicky, I think we got to hit you with a couple more pit stop questions. And I think it would be unfair not to ask you guys one of our classics, which is, and don't answer at the same time, the sexiest car of all time. Alfa Romeo. She won't name a model. <laughs> she won't. No, you know, you know what? Jerkin's not I, her I, thing. No. Pretty red one. No, 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 not Alfa Romeo. <laughs> and I'm sorry, the Aston Martin. I always like the old Aston Martins. Like James that, Bond, Aston yeah. Martins, okay, yeah. DB5s, okay. Yeah, I don't know model names or anything like that, but I've always thought that they were just like... Really well, you can go with animal, mineral, vegetable, or, you Pretty know, what it's... A, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she, can draw, she can draw it for you, not That's a problem. That's awesome. That's awesome. But, you know, she doesn't know the word. We have a segment in Dominate with Dawson. Sometimes we have what we call the one-on-one jargon segments, and Vicky's the entire reason why we have it. I don't She's, know my jargon. And it's acronym I'm, soup, I'm still right? learning. Yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah. I, I'm I not from a car background. Nope. <laughs> so how about we expand it for Bill, since you know uh-huh. probably more models than I do, and and take that Doubt as a compliment. It. Take that as Doubt a compliment. It. We're going to give you the three car garage question or the million dollar person mm-hmm. question. So in your three car garage, what would you park in it? Do I have a budget? Uh, no, that's why it's the million dollar person question. You spend whatever you want. I'm at three and a half just to start because I'm going to get my Ferrari GTO going because, you know, I'd rather have one of those. Wow. So taco truck. No, that's Jennifer. <laughs> we do this question a little differently and you'll be subjected to ours. Don't worry. It's coming. I think what I would do is I would get some type of retro mod 77 Trans Am. So I still look smoky and the bandit on the outside, but it actually drives well and has acceleration. That would be a unique situation for that car. <sighs> Let's see what else. I, I've done I've done that. I, I drove a 400 horsepower one. I still leave it on the list of never drive your Euros. Oh no. Yeah. See, we had a we had a 75 Camaro in the family. I was too young to drive it, but that was fun. 
I don't necessarily want the horsepower. I have a self-imposed limit for track cars. Like I don't really care about going fast. Like the car that came to mind was I want to get a McLaren F1 in these three cars, but it's so fast. You can't really get to the limit until you're going really fast, as opposed to I drive a, an ND Miata 2019 and the limits are much lower and the fit's going to be even more lower. Recently, we had a M240i BMW. Great car, accelerated well, turbo, no problem, tons of power, but I couldn't really have fun in it and not worry about going to jail. So there's a limit in, you know, street car versus race car kind of thing. Anyway, I got to pick another car, don't I? Hmm. Yeah. Um, we've had some really creative, and, and as you guys know, fans of the show, we've yeah. had some really creative answers over the years mm-hmm. as to what people are shoving into this garage and how the mm-hmm. garage is configured and is it on an island and, you know, all sorts of fun stuff. Let's, let's go I think with Vicky, Vicky would Vicky would love to have the Capri done the way we had scheduled. We just don't have the skills to do it. I think that would be fun for her. Beautiful mm-hmm. car, by the way. I love those things. European yeah. Mustang, right? Mm-hmm. 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 Yep. I think like every person who's in the cars, it's going to change every day. And right now, the one that, that's intriguing me is a, a race prep classic mini original body or new yeah. body no the old ones i think that would be a ton of fun those cars can embarrass some pretty good hardware out there on the racetrack so that'd be kind of fun and i give you your front wheel drive because you're going to have to come out there and make sure it's right for me so i need your help <laughs> any any day of the week it would be unfair not to ask you guys your opinion on what we call the evolution so what do we think about evs and evs at the track and just electric vehicles in general I think they're coming along. I think they're going to be able to keep up, but I just don't think that they will be able to sustain. I mean, I've seen people run them. I think there's just been a couple, but I don't know how they would manage an endurance race. (laughs) No hot swapping of batteries yet. I've coached in a couple of Teslas, so I have opinions about them too. But Mm -hmm. Bill, what do you think? I like light cars. I typically like light and small cars. Do you have a Lotus tattoo that we don't know about? I would, I would really, I really want to drive a Lotus. I haven't done that yet. I'm I'm waiting for a student to have a Lotus. So if any students want to come my way and request me, you know, why you would do that, I have no idea, but I'll definitely take that. If I can get my uh, mutant head and helmet into your car, I'd love to get in there because double XL helmet, man, too much brain. I'm six, four and over 300 pounds and I've driven a Lotus. So you'll fit. Okay. (laughs) Sounds great. And that's Brad's rule. If he fits, he sits, he drives. That works for me. So right now we've got a weight issue in my mind for EVs. Acceleration is not the problem. Trying to figure out how much trouble I want to get myself into. The environmental impact of an EV is in some cases misrepresented and misunderstood. If you look at a lot of the situation and I know that while California is leading the charge for EVs, they can't even keep their air conditioners on in the summertime. So what are they going to do when everybody's got a EV car and charging and powers off, but you know, that's California in racing. It's probably tremendous for drag racing, probably okay for sprint racing. Endurance racing is going to be a challenge. Your energy density per mass is quite a challenge unless you're doing hot swaps, but then you're also basically going to have a a large generator in order to, to recharge your batteries. If you're doing an endurance race. So are you really an EV or are you just a big diesel? So there's some challenges there. Liking small light cars and EV is not in my horizon. I think it's probably a tremendous commuter car, city car. But in the U.S., if you're not in the East Coast or West Coast densely populated area, it can be a challenge because everybody's like, oh, the the average commute is two or three miles or 10 miles or 20 minutes or it depends on who reports it, right? Average is far from normal. You get a lot of people who their commute is literally in New York City, their commute is to walk to the subway and take the subway. So is that commute like 30 feet? Maybe. I don't know how they're calculating average. So I know that I drive way too much right now for a current EV to be practical in, in our life. Vicky could probably get away with it because she doesn't travel as much for work. But I drive to Huntsville, Alabama from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Yeah, I'm kind of silly, but don't know that it fits our lifestyle at this point. And it's not a matter of range. It's a matter of recharge. And the, the recharge to me is more important than the range because I can handle a car that gets 200 miles in a gas tank and it takes me five minutes to fill it up. But if it's even 300 miles and it takes me 45 minutes, that, that trip to Huntsville is going to get really painful. Let me ask you this. Just if you put all that stuff aside, is there an EV though that has caught your attention that maybe you're keeping an eye on that if they get the formula right, you would consider crossing that threshold? Admittedly, I have looked at the original Tesla Roasters which their pricing has started to get a little crazy, but everything right now is crazy. I think 
I would be tempted with some of the hybrid sports cars, but there's no EVs right now that interest me. I she pass. Likes, she likes the white ones. Yeah, I pass. <laughs> listen, listen, I don't have car knowledge like that. I just don't. Now, you know, put me in MoMA in New York City. I can start not, telling you all about Not the steering the... wheel. She's talking no. about the Museum of Modern Art. So Yes. Not, yeah, put, I, can, I, can, I can walk you through that. But, you know, when it comes to the car history, and I just don't have that knowledge. It comes a time. It does. It does. And my, and... A couple of coffee table books will really help. I'm yeah. Telling you. Well, I'm, I'm, a fi- I'm like officially two years, like heavily into this. I have a ways the, to go. One of the Old biggest Top frustrations. Gear episodes, too. Yeah. <laughs> Biggest frustration I have is, you know, when she needs to get a new car and I ask her what she wants, she gives me lots of criteria and none of them are useful. It's just like, (laughs) it's got to be able to fit the dog. And then, you know, every now and then we go skiing. So we have to be able to pack everything. And I'm like, we go skiing like once every two years. So to to remedy that problem, (laughs) we approached one vehicle purchase the same way you were talking about prepping for the track. It was spreadsheets and calculations and how much cargo space and people room and all this kind of crazy stuff. And it got to the point where... I satisfied all the requirements that my wife needed. And then I finally said, just walk up and down the aisles at CarMax and point at something. And then we'll go from there. (laughs) (laughs) You know what car has the most interior space that you could ever ask for? The one that you rent when you actually need that much space. (laughs) Pick your monster SUV and you can fit as many people as you want in there. You can fit more people than we know in there. And I don't have to drive it every single day. It's fantastic. So let's transition. What are some future goals for the race team and the, the podcast? Like, where where are you all going with this? Are you going to lose the in training at some point? No, we're no. never going to lose the in training. We will we don't forever think anybody be in ever training. Does. I mean, I don't think any driver mm-hmm. should ever think that they've. Mm-hmm. I've yet to meet anybody, including everybody on our team, who got out after one lap or one stint and said, "Yep, nailed it." Right. <laughs> didn't, didn't miss a thing. Every apex dead on. That's all there is, you know, maybe Randy Post, but not us. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Randy's still training and learning and, and trying. So, you know, if he's still mm-hmm. going at it, I know I need to. Where do we see the podcast going? Well, right now we see it going to episode 334. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the next one. Yeah. I'm kind of an in the moment guy. We have general goals, but mm-hmm. nothing really yeah. metric related. We, we want to help people. And the more people we help, the, the happier we are. I think for our podcast, I'd like to kind of steer up a little bit back to our team and see, mm-hmm. because we haven't had a really good chance to expand on the growth that we have. We haven't done that in a while. I'd like to revisit that. But great guests learning with the podcast. And, you know, just keep it going. It's a great way to make friends. And, you know, out on the track, and they come up, it's like, hey, garage years in training, and they start talking. And, and it's like, whoa, like, people are starting to know us. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's kind of weird. It's crazy. What about your driving, though? I would like to get to level four into Great Lakes. For sure. With the racing, I mean, I like to do some more lucky dogs. I like to kind of advance. I'm, listen, I'm not going to be that person who's going to go grab a trophy out of with some kind of money or whatever, get sponsors. It's not going to happen. It's not the goal. I think send the goal... information to garage and training at gmail.com, though, if yeah. you're interested in being dumb enough to do it. No, we're just kidding. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, honestly, my goal is, is to enjoy the racing, try a couple new series, kind of push myself a little bit when I start getting more comfortable in my skill set, but generally just retire in to being an instructor when the time comes. I mean, I mean, what a way to go. And just to keep moving is just when you're just older and just be able to share your skills. So you said something really interesting. Retire into being an instructor. It makes it sound like being an instructor is where, you know, race car drivers go to die or something. I don't know if they're retired. <laughs> no, or but Boy, what I want to get to is it's actually a great jumping off point for you guys. And as Bill knows, as he's transitioned to becoming an instructor, mm-hmm. that in training is even more important. I mean, I've been an instructor now for almost a decade and I never stop learning. I learn so many mm-hmm. things from my students more so than mm-hmm. I do behind the wheel because I get on NJMP or pit race. And the lap is muscle memory. You just do it. You've done it the same way forever. Mm -hmm. You know what your optimal lap time is. You've got all that stuff down, but it's when you get in with the student, all hell breaks loose because you Mm -hmm. don't have control over those variables. You still continue to learn and you still continue to grow as a driver. Well, the thing is too, is that when people kind of hit retirement age, they either, (laughs) no, seriously, I am dead serious. Like I have like an 27. No, yeah, right. As we get older, I'm approaching the generation 
ahead of me that you know i'm watching my parents get older and they're very Cadillacs, they're, yeah right but you know a body in motion stays in motion and when you start getting older you start going more into isolation so what a better way to stay moving to be social and to get out and be part of something is to retire into something like that very true very well said so i have goals i have goals for every stint of a hbde so if you want to know what my goals are i will refer to my goal list we have compete in the nasa thunderhill 25 we have gltc and not be last would be fantastic i'd like to be middle that'd be kind of fun i've got tracks i want to go to i've got different places i want to be the, the one thing i don't have is i don't have the i want to drive a super fast car i don't care i'm more than happy spec e46 is my self-imposed limit everybody keeps saying that'll change but it's not going to change so since you brought it up one final pit stop question what tracks are still on your bucket list Anyone we've hit some really good tracks we, we've actually hit some very good tracks i want to hit um, them all right now ozarks comes to mind because it's new we're still trying to get to vir yeah vir is number one we you know, it, it shocks yet. me when people say that because for us it's like we've been to vir a million times or the Glen, and you're like really that's on your bucket list i had yeah. no offense by the way i'm just saying no, well, we've, but, done the, the, we've done the Glen. it's just yeah. vir is not raced in most of the series that we've raced in ah that makes sense and at a pack of our friends from racing that race in the south that we meet at periodically at a couple racetracks that's their home base. And of course we have the dominating with Dawson, Ben Dawson, we have yet to meet in person and that's one of his home tracks. Just to be at VIR would be fun just to catch up with a pack of people and try a new racetrack. We, we went to the track and we realized, you know, I'm a natural driver, I'm an excellent driver, this is great. We go to the track for the first time, we realize, wow, this is not different. This is way different. So then we started realizing, you know, if we do this HBDE thing, there's actually skills that we don't have. So we started doing the HBDE thing. And the first season we did that was our second season of racing. We tried all the different HPDEs and the one that we liked the best happened to be NASA Great Lakes, which is so inconveniently far for us. The closest one's five hours. It just gets worse. And NZM is probably the first, and that's 15 something hours from our house. Yeah, but I got to try mid-Ohio. Oh. That's true. That's true. <laughs> And we've done Gingerman with them. We've done Audubon. We've done Mid-Ohio. We've done pretty much yeah. all the tracks that they do. Pit race, sure. The only places that we can go, I, I just did our first AER race, which was fun. Vicky and Jennifer aren't quite ready yet. They don't feel they're ready. It's mm -hmm. not whether they're ready or not. It's they don't feel they're ready. So there's very few series that we can race at VIR, but we're finding more and more HPDEs with the opportunity to go to VIR. So that's probably where we're going to end up going. It's been on the list. We had the plague. So that was two years of mm -hmm. non-real racing. You know, hopefully we're post-plague for everybody's sake and the world's sake. Mm -hmm. That would be fantastic. It's on our goal for this year. I'd say it's probably 50-50 whether we'll actually pull it off. But um, we may go there just and not drive. But I'd really like to drive there. That would be fun. Mm -hmm. Don't go to VIR and not drive. That's my number I know, one piece that's of the advice. Bad thing. Yeah. I didn't and say I would say drive this, down in the car. It will quickly would... move up if not in your top five, somewhere very close to. It is an absolutely amazing lap. Mm -hmm. so, and owned by one of the co-owners of Pit Race, from what I understand, or something. There's some really? relationship there, really? yeah. Pit Race is lovely. I like that. That's my favorite current. That's favorite a great, right that's a great lap as well. So mm -hmm. I tend to look outside of the US. I've been to a lot of tracks myself. I used to kart race all over the country, things like that. And so I always have things in my mind. And Brad knows I want to run at Brands Hatch, right? And something mm -hmm. low horsepower, stuff like that. Like there's some yep. really cool tracks outside of the u.s that i think are still on my list that i'll, I'll get there you know what i mean yeah, they're all on the list it's you know the bucket <laughs> is very large for the number of tracks i want to go to because i'd like to try them all and usually once you try it once you usually want to do it again so you know it's kind of like sushi right you, you try yeah. it the first time and it's just like a totally weird experience you have to try it the second time because you know what you're doing you're going into it it's just like a track you know what you're doing you know that you know the scariest thing to me was when i didn't prep the way that i've developed into prepping for going to watkins Glen. and and I was coming up to a turn and I didn't know if it was a left or a right. And Watkins Glen is not a good place for that to be happening. I'm very anal about my track prep for new tracks, but the second time is always you better don't, than the first you time. Don't, you don't say. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah Bill, Bill at one point, he, he caught a really good idea. He went out and he got large three by four foot track maps and he had them laminated to where we can actually write on them. He actually puts them on our walls and we can edit our notes on it or he can, when he's instructing somebody, he can actually draw it around, make the marks on it and then take our students out. So we'll either hang them up inside the paddock or we'll hang them up inside the trailers. But he's picked up a couple tips and <laughs> he's always pushing us forward. In training. So, in training. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So that being said, Bill and Vicky, any shout outs, promotions, thank yous, anything else you'd like to share with our audience that we didn't cover thus far? We have some discounts that don't do anything for us, but if people want to use them, we've got discount for Apex Pro, which is really great entryway, especially into telemetry. It's a great we system. Had, we had Andrew on in a previous Andrew's episode. awesome. Yeah. yeah. Recently, we're trying out a system from Candelaria on uh, the Sentinel system, which is a in-car live video streaming capability with three cameras and uh, integrates with your AIM system. So he's got a discount for that. The thing that we like to do is really to be a resource where if you've got a question, hopefully we've had a podcast that will deal with it from either our experience or from an expert's expertise, go into it and hopefully solve one of your problems quickly. Like a, a lot of times on the internet, you'll see in Facebook, people just coming into the sport to be like, I hate my radio. It doesn't work. We always say, go to this episode. We had Samson on and they, they just solved all our problems and it was cheap. I mean, it's so cheap to fix our radios and reinventing the wheel and racing can get very expensive. So hopefully we can save you some time and some money, be somewhat entertaining. We try to be entertaining. Sometimes I don't know that we succeed, but th that is the goal. And hopefully you get a little better. Mm -hmm. you know, although we're in the same circle and, you know, petrol heads of a feather yep. flock together, right? We're not really Absolutely. competing with one another for airtime mm -hmm. or for personalities, Never. which is fantastic. No. Bigger yeah. boat, baby. Yeah, right. right. Well, I look at it as the Japanese philosophy, rising tides lift all ships, right? So we're exactly. all doing, we're all in this together, you know, at the end of the yeah, day. But I like, I like not only the rising tide, but I want to give everybody a bigger boat. I'm usually the guy with the drill though, putting holes yeah, in that's the okay. hall. Right? Yeah. That's I thought that okay. was my job. <laughs> we're, we're, we're a very, very inclusive team. We are honored to have had Bill and Vicky from Garage Heroes and Training on BreakFix. And we look up to you guys, not only for your racing pursuits, but being superheroes in the automotive and motorsport podcasting scene with over 300 plus episodes for folks to catch up on. You should not be honored and you should aim much higher than where we're at. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you can find out more about Garage Heroes and Training by visiting their website, www.garageheroesandtraining.com. Search for their show on all your favorite podcatchers and follow them on social media at Garage Heroes and Training on Instagram and Facebook and Garage Heroes IT on the Twitter. And if you'd like to be on their show, you can reach out to Bill and the team at Garage Heroes and Training at gmail.com. Thank well, you for inviting us on, though. Absolutely. And, you know, obviously it'll be fun to be on your show where we get to be interviewed yeah, because absolutely. I'm sure for you guys, it's very different to be on the yeah. other on the receiving end of this. Right. So, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So he is called the interrogator. So, you know, just <laughs> warning you for when you do come on. So very nice. Well, Vicki and Bill, I cannot thank you guys enough for coming on Break Fix and sharing your origin story. And we really do appreciate everything you're doing for the motorsports community, for everybody out there that's looking to get into this sport, into this hobby, getting them up off their couches and into the paddock and behind the seats of race cars or just any other Chevy Malibu that they found at the Hertz <laughs> Rental Lot. So that being said, again, thank you for coming on, sharing your story. And we look forward to part two of this episode when we visit you guys on Garage Heroes and Training. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having us on. And uh, hopefully, we, hopefully we didn't break your podcast and hopefully we fixed it just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having us. That's right, listeners. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out our Patreon for a follow on Pit Stop mini -sode. So check that out on www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports and get access to all sorts of behind the scenes content from this episode and more. If you like what you've heard and want to learn more about GTM, be sure to check us out on www.gtmotorsports.org. You can also find us on Instagram at Grand Touring Motorsports. Also, if you want to get involved or have suggestions for future shows, you can call or text us at 202-630-1770 or send us an email at crewchief at gtmotorsports.org. We'd love to hear from you. Hey, everybody. Crew Chief Eric here. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Break Fix, and we wanted to remind you that GTM remains a no annual fees organization. And our goal is to continue to bring you quality episodes like this one at no charge. As a loyal listener, please consider subscribing to our Patreon for bonus and behind the scenes content, extra goodies, and GTM swag. 
For as little as $2.50 a month, you can keep our developers, writers, editors, casters, and other volunteers fed on their strict diet of Fig Newtons, Gummy Bears, and Monster. Consider signing up for Patreon today at www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports. And remember, without fans, supporters, and members like you, none of this would be possible.